Hello, and welcome to this week's program of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Each week we connect with and hear from fascinating and inspirational speakers, often with a message focused on our interests in innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. As a Rotary Club, we look for ways that these programs might foster new approaches to improving communities near and far. We're glad you've joined us, and we hope that you'll um, enjoy exploring how technology can serve the business and service to others. This week, we have a very exciting program. We're going to hear about the ARIES project, which is the African Ruggedized Education System. And it is a now global grant project that is being done in Kenya and other countries. We have today three wonderful speakers. We have Sean Hogan, Bonnie Sutherland, and Mark Mattel, all founders of the Rotary, of this uh, ARIES project. And I look forward to hearing so much more. Sean, please, please go ahead. Thank you, Tatiana. It's a pleasure to be talking to your club. We're very excited to be speaking with you and learning about the Zoom technology that uh, all of Rotary has been learning together. Uh, what we've got is a nine minute or so video that'll give a bit of background and then we'll open up for questions and discussion. Perfect. I'm okay. sharing your screen and playing the video. Perfect. No worries. Project has the potential to revolution. My name is Sean Hogan, and I've been a Rotarian for over 30 years. During my time in Rotary, I've seen many great projects that have changed the lives of children, of families, and of communities. But I've never been part of a project that has as much potential as the ARIES project. ARIES stands for African Ruggedized Education System. We're running the pilot project in Kenya and believe that the ARIES project has the potential to revolutionize education in rural communities around the world. The story of the ARIES project begins with Bonnie Sutherland. Bonnie and her husband Don were teachers in Delta, British Columbia, Canada. In 1992, they went on a trip around the world that eventually took them to Africa, where they saw a great need. Returning home, they formed the AfroTech Aid Society and began shipping books and other educational material to African countries. That modest beginning grew over time until they were shipping 40-foot containers with materials to build libraries, computer labs, medical clinics, and hospitals. Bonnie and I are members of the North Delta Rotary Club. In 2009, my wife and I, along with our 16-year-old daughter, joined Bonnie and her team in Kenya. I assisted the tech group to install computer labs in schools and community centers. Those computer labs were much like the ones that you see here, with large monitors and PCs that had software loaded on them. The problem was that when we returned the following year, we found that most of those computer labs were no longer working. People had stolen parts, mice, keyboards, hard drives, and RAM, or had downloaded viruses so the computers no longer worked. In 2011, Mark Niddle joined the team. Mark worked at IBM for 30 years until retiring to Bellingham, Washington, USA to open his own computer company. While in Kenya, Mark saw the problem with the computer labs and decided there must be a better way. So he developed Ares. The heart of the Ares project is the server. Mark built a small server using a solid state hard drive with no moving parts so that it's ruggedized to be heat, dust, and drop resistant. The server can connect up to 50 wireless devices, including laptops, tablets, and smartphones. There are four elements to the success of the Ares project. The first element is the hardware. In addition to a server, we supply schools with laptops, a projector, and speakers. We had been supplying 10 laptops along with PCs, but have decided to increase the number of laptops to 20 per lab. The cost to set up an Ares lab is around 5,500 US dollars. All of the equipment runs on batteries, so when the power goes out, as it does frequently, the equipment continues to work. We also supply wireless adapters for PCs so that the schools can use existing computers to connect to the server. The laptops are very basic, similar to Chromebooks, with small hard drives, an operating system, and an internet browser. None of the data is held on the laptops. The laptops simply connect it to the data on the server. The second element is the software. Mark has negotiated with organizations that license the software to us at no charge as a not-for-profit group. The software includes the Khan Academy, which has thousands of teaching videos from preschool to post-grad, from basic math to algebra, to science, humanities, history, geography, computer programming, and much more. There's a school version of Wikipedia, hundreds of TED Talks, and 45,000 downloadable books. There are textbooks from kindergarten to grade 12 for students, 
and a section for teachers with the same textbooks that have the answers and study plans. There are additional sections for the general community, including agricultural and medical material. And there's much, much more. Anything digital can be added to the server. For Kenya, we have material in Swahili. And for other countries, we can add French, Spanish, or other local language material. The third element is working with the teachers. Since the teachers in remote rural areas often have very few resources, much of the teaching is done by rote learning. Teachers using ARIES not only have to be familiar with the material, but also need to learn how to teach using the resources. Teachers learn that they can still lead the class using the projector and speakers, and allow the students to do independent study and review lessons until they learn it. The fourth element to the success of the ARIES project is building our partnerships. Those include our partners at home, such as Rotary World Help, which ships 40-foot containers of educational, technological, and medical material, as well as our software partners. It also includes our partners in Kenya, such as Computers for Schools Kenya, which processes the tech that's sent by Rotary World Help, and the Old Pajeta Conservancy, which is our liaison with local schools. In this picture, you see three of our Kenyan team, Wondetto, Ian, and Nicholas, who continue to support the schools and run the project when we return home. They ensure that the computer labs keep working. They also install updates to the software every year using a USB provided by Mark. The ARIES project would not be successful without the help of our Kenyan partners. 2019 is a significant year for the ARIES project thanks to a Rotary Global Grant. Four local Rotary clubs in Canada and the US donated 5,000 US dollars each, which was multiplied by matching grants from Rotary District 5050 the Rotary Foundation, and the Government of Canada, so that we received over $129,000. To obtain statistically significant results, we've concentrated our efforts in the Laikipia County area of Kenya. The main city in the area is Nanyuki, located about a four or five hour drive north of Nairobi, directly on the equator near Mount Kenya. Our team spent a busy two weeks in January 2019 to begin the first installations under the Global Grant. Our plan was to install ARIES in six secondary schools. Thanks to a very efficient team of volunteers, we were able to install ARIES in eight schools. The servers and laptops are built in China and shipped to Kenya. Our team prepares them by installing the software, testing the equipment, and then going to the schools to set up the computer labs. We then have a tutorial with the teachers and, if time permits, with the students. We also held a two-day weekend workshop with teachers, administrators, and IT managers from the schools receiving the ARIES system. It was a well-attended training weekend with very dedicated and enthusiastic teachers. These sessions and the feedback that we received from the teachers also help us to improve the project. This is Judy, the teacher librarian at Sweetwater Secondary, the very first school to receive an ARIES system in 2015. One of the requirements for schools is to build a locked storage area so the equipment can be stored safely. Judy's school had a padlock that was on the outside, which someone opened with a crowbar and stole everything. We now require schools to have a sheath over the padlock so that a crowbar won't work. This story has a happy ending though. Judy had installed tracking software on the laptops, so when the thief went to an internet cafe and booted up one of the laptops, Judy notified the police, who were able to arrest the thief and recover all the equipment. This is a picture that I took when we installed the first system at Sweetwater Secondary. I'd noticed this girl earlier, she seemed unhappy and disinterested. Then she sat down with the teacher at a laptop and as I took this picture, her face just lit up with a huge smile. Afterwards, I asked the teacher about the student and he told me her story. He said that she was the smartest student in the school, but was completely bored because there was nothing new for her to learn with the limited resources at the school. Aries opened up an entire new world for her. In 2013, the team installed the ARIES system in a secondary school that was near the bottom of the 26,000 secondary schools in Kenya. Within three months, that school was in the top 30, and every single one of their students passed their qualification exams to enable them to go on to post-secondary. By the way, this photo isn't the students from that school. This is from a primary school where we installed a library during one of our visits. Primary school students are far more friendly and enthusiastic than the cool and reserved secondary students, so I like their photo better. This is a picture that I took while bouncing in the back of a truck along a dirt road on the way to a remote school. I use this picture for two reasons. 
The first is a reminder that the ARI system uses batteries, so you can literally hold a class under a tree in the middle of a field. The second is that it reminds me of one of my favorite sayings, you may never sit under the shade of the tree whose seed you planted. The ARIES project is changing the lives of a generation of young people. As of February 2019, we have now installed ARIES labs in 47 schools. Those changes will continue to ripple outwards to change the lives of their parents and their families. Through our actions, Rotarians change the lives of entire communities and countries. And as we've seen through our Polio Plus program, we make changes that affect the entire world. But we will never see the full impact of the differences that we are making, and those that we help may never know that it was our efforts that improved their lives. Rotarians are people of action. The lessons Rotarians and our partners learn in Kenya will help expand the ARIES project to other communities and other countries. Together, we transform lives, and together, we change the future. Thank you. Mark, thank you. That was a fantastic video and a wonderful introduction to ARIES. We would love to hear more about the project um, as it stands now and the things that you are working towards and, and anything else you would like to share about the project. It sounds really fascinating. So there's been a lot of progress since we filmed that video in 2019. Uh, we returned to Kenya in January of this year and completed the second half of the project. And then we've been looking at expanding it to other countries. But I'll let Mark speak to a little bit about the, the uh, updates since we've done that video. Mark? Uh, yeah, I mean, a number of things to add. Thanks, John. Um, one is obviously we've done more schools. And as Bonnie said, we're finishing up this branch and looking forward to some new things. Um, I think a couple of things that have come to us that look like challenges that we want to take on and uh, could be really good opportunities. Uh, one is that, um, as you probably know and have heard, there is a substantial number of refugee camps across Africa, uh, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and uh, through Bonnie's efforts, mostly we've gotten the attention of um, one group called the Wendell Foundation that's now uh, that's based in Oxford, England, that funds schools in these uh, refugee camps. And the one we're looking at now is the God, that has 250,000 people in it. 90,000 students, and they're very interested in getting there some better because they have virtually no digitized learning there whatsoever, and they've been looking for a solution like this. Uh, so that trial is just starting, and that's going to be pretty exciting to see how that goes. The second thing is, um, again, through some combination of with Bonnie and uh, some of our other partners, we're finally starting to get the attention of the African or the Kenyan government, which, as you can imagine, has been a little resistant to anything coming in from the outside, but once we've gotten high up in the uh, government structure, they've shown some serious interest in some trials. So our hope is that we can expand this uh, with some support from the government and uh, through some efforts in other areas. But frankly, I mean, although the funding still our biggest issue, we found ways to scale this substantially now through a lot of uh, learning and a lot of experimentation. But now it's one where we can scale across Eastern Africa, I think, pretty easily, but um, obviously funding is always the biggest issue because we need to pay not just the hardware, but for uh, support staff, and that's really important to have. It. Anybody want to add anything about it, Bonnie? Um, Mark, those were very interesting points. Um, so to summarize, the first one, you guys are starting to work with refugee camps, and one in particular in Canada. I was staggered by the number you mentioned of 90,000 students who are in the camp who are not any access currently to digital education. That's, uh, that's just a huge number and what an important uh, area to, to um, it seems so well placed. And then the second um, project that you mentioned was with the Kenyan government and, um, and I can really understand um, your points that funding is one of the biggest issues. Um, did, did you find that your, uh, your work with the Rotary uh, District, the Rotary Foundation, and the Government of Canada to really have amplified your efforts in this last year to oh, yeah. projects that you were doing. Absolutely. We would, yeah. we would be nowhere without Rotary in this. Uh, there's just no question about that. Um, mm -hmm. The only way we've been able to get the funding is through the large use of the uh, members of Rotary Clubs, uh, backed up by the district grants and the internet and the 
Rotary and national grants. And then luckily the Canadian government's had a strong effort to outreach into African communities and that's made a big difference. So the fact that we were able to take a reasonably small amount, $5,000 from four clubs and turn it into 145 is a pretty staggering project given the small amount yes. that each club put into it. But uh, whether we can do that again remains to be seen. So we're just looking for other clubs that want to participate and see if we can get more support. Uh, from other places, but again, it has to be coordinated. We, you know, it really needs to be something well thought through every time we do it to make sure we have the support structure and the training. Otherwise, it's uh, it's a little bit like someone just uh, a lot of hard work with training. Yes, I can imagine your comment about the support staff. You you mentioned in the video that you have some support uh, staff members from the um, from the group that help, that you've been working with. How um, often do you find the schools require updates and support staff to come in to keep the system running smoothly? Uh, that's a great question. By the way, my name is Sean Piping here in Kenya. Um, we've been really lucky in uh, Kenya that we've found a couple of really good partners. Obviously, Sean mentioned in the, the uh, Old Pajeta Conservancy and Computers for Schools in Kenya, and particularly the um, Old Pajeta, since we've been working in that area, has provided us some higher dedicated staff in that area to work with us. And, and, and it's been really fortuitous because in both cases, they're really outgoing people, very strong backgrounds in education. One of them also is an IT, ICT expert, and it's amazing how much the schools rely on those people. Because without them, I mean, we were there for a month or you know, a few weeks when we leave, and you'd think they could communicate with us uh, over, the, over the divide, but it's really hard. They don't have good communication. They need somebody that can get on a motorcycle and ride out of industry roads and go out and sit with them for a day, show the teachers again how to use it and actually sit with them and make sure the hardware is working and make sure they update the servers and all that stuff happens. Without that, I think it feels lost and we would probably go back into the cabinet somewhere. But it's absolutely fundamental. It, it seems really key, as you were mentioning, because it just makes the access open for teachers to continue learning or relearning how to use the system yeah. effectively. And yeah, um, do you find just to add something that uh, I'm not sure Sean mentioned around, but it's been amazing to all of us when we get these things set up in the schools. We bring the teachers and the uh, students in for training. Teachers will walk in and they'll stare at a keyboard like they've never seen one before because a bunch of them haven't. Uh, they lived out in the remote villages themselves and uh, they managed to get some training as a teacher, but they've got virtually no experience with computers. So they need to be taught too. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can imagine that. Um, uh, the, last picture, the last picture that I showed on the uh, PowerPoint was a school that was about two hours away from where we were, a lot of dirt roads. That's when mm -hmm. I was bouncing on when I took the picture of the tree, Mark and I in the back of a truck, mm -hmm. but the, um, the school there had one laptop and the principal had locked it up because the teachers were all fighting over. So just having this whole computer lab just opened up the entire world for them. I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, do you find, uh, Sean or Mark or Bobby, that um, you've had problems with theft? I know you mentioned it a little bit in the video, Sean. Yeah, have you found that um, it, it has um, continued or because the system is now um, the 20 Chromebooks and the one server that it's a little bit easier to take care of than say the larger computer labs that you guys started with some years back. I do I need to get a in here. I did, early on we did and I think we have to put this in perspective too. This is not theft for the sole purpose of just making money. These are desperate people that literally the sale of a laptop can feed a family there for quite a while. It's a big deal to them. Yeah. Um, put that in perspective. But so it's going to happen. Um, on the other hand, we have been very rigorous since we had this happen and doing school prep and the support staff we talked about, they will not bring us into the school now unless they guarantee that the windows have metal bars you know, at the school that they have a lockable cabinet that the equipment can go into and that everybody understands the importance that if the server or notebook gets stole that you know that, that's a student in the school classroom that doesn't have access to it. So it's not uh, it's not pervasive and I think doing those simple steps has made all the difference in the world. We haven't had a repeat occurrence. Yeah. 
That's wonderful news. That's fantastic because the technology so, um, can open up so many doors. They're so glad that it's there and available to the students. Ha have you found that some of the students um, have been able to undertake new studies? Uh, you mentioned schools moving rankings from lower to higher levels. Have you found that certain students have also, you've heard some success stories where they've really been able to use this information to take to uh, post-secondary or to do projects that are um, were well beyond the capabilities of the school before? Bonnie, you're the teacher. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Bonnie and I are in the same house. I was just over at her computer trying to get her video working. But Bonnie, if you want to unmute yourself and join in. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Well, that's good. You may not see me, but you can hear me. Hello. Um, the, first of all, these students are going from a position of very, very limited um, content to a content-rich environment. And that, that is going to take a, a while in order to fully assess the impact. However, what we have discovered is that more and more students are who are right because they write a, a across the uh, a country um, countrywide exams at the end of form four to see who will go on to university or, or college and so on and we um i think i can say anecdotally that we are seeing a larger larger number of students um, meeting the criteria and and um able to find placements at the tertiary level simply because of that. But I'm, I think that education is more than just the ability to go on to university. I think there's a broad base of information in that content that expands into agriculture and other areas as well. That's going to be harder to assess, but is it making a difference? Anecdotally, we already know it is. So I have a question. <laughs> go ahead, Sandy. Um, so, in larger schools in that environment, where you have, say, around a thousand students, how do you manage the limited amount of resources that you can, you know, meaning if you are putting 50 computers in a school and the server, um, how do they normally manage that so that the students get adequate access to it? Uh, well, first of all, um, we have we have the pico projector so one pico projector and one um and one laptop it means that you can show a video or or a, a, a biology um video or, or a chemistry video or or a, a virtual lab with 50 students at one time right so you still have 49 other units also students can download to a, a smartphone or a tablet, they can download um, books and, and so on. So, there, um, and as a teacher myself, I can tell you that not the entire time do you spend it on the internet. You, you have various times where you direct students different times for different purposes. And um, you don't need to be on the internet for an hour. Uh, it might, maybe you have 20 minutes. And they, they're, they're quite used to sharing three to a single computer. Yes. Believe me, yes. That's, that's not un unusual at all. Would we like to have a, um, a more perfect system where they, they, all have, they all have their own individual laptops, the kinds of things that we're struggling with here as we um, deal with the pandemic? No. Um, that's not going to happen for a long, long time. But sure. But they've gone from zero to this amount of access we are finding the access is actually very very well managed the teachers are doing a good job great yeah, the key thing is the portability we can the server can if it needs to be be carried just picked up with the battery and walked into any room they need but reality what we found is the wireless signal reaches across the entire school anyway so and most they need to take a notebook to each classroom, and if they have notebooks in each classroom and they need them, they'll take them, they're they usually in the library, or they take the projector with them, and they don't have to move anything with that. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about that. I, I was just returned um, from 
Ethiopia where I taught English to 11th graders in a really resource starved environment, I ended up buying textbooks for my students because they just weren't available at all. And so um, I'm very interested by this because I will be going back and um, we are really looking for ways to, you know, bring and bring better technology to the schools. May I break in? Uh, we have a, um, Aries has quite a quite a broad. Um, it, it projects for quite a ways. Um, so a single mm -hmm. Aries unit will project across an entire school. It mm -hmm. doesn't go through concrete very easily, but it goes through wood just fine. Yeah. So you have a yeah. radius. You have a, a, a broadcast radius of um, well. We know under optimum conditions, it's gone 300, um, close to 300 meters. But mm -hmm. I would say certainly within 200 meters, you're, you, can, you can cover a number of classrooms. And you can have, uh, if you had three or four Pico projectors, that would be even better. Yeah. We watched, um, we watched the teachers. because And when we did the training sessions, we always put the teachers in their, um, in their um, academic groups and they would come up with lessons to show us, or lessons, because often teachers had tried it, and they, they actually were already had lessons that they could present from the previous year, some of them, mm -hmm. them as well. And I saw a particularly good one on the dollhouse in red, not by Ibsen, imagine that. Huh, great. Uh, and she was using the Pico projector, and it was a, it was a fast moving and interesting lesson. And within a few minutes, she had the entire group of teachers, 50 odd teachers, all interested in what was going on. Hmm. So. That's fantastic. Yeah, one of the things I meant- Love teacher all those books. Mm -hmm. One of the things I mentioned in the video is this is really a, a testing ground for us, which is why we're concentrating in this one area of Kenya. And we're learning a lot of lessons um, about theft of items, about how to best produce it, as well as getting a lot of feedback. Um, what our Kenyan partners are doing is they're doing surveys of the, the uh, schools and the teachers and the students. So we're going to get some hard data so we're not just relying on anecdotal information. Right. Very helpful in, in uh, creating those um, measurements uh, to see how effective it is. But it's not really our um, proprietary product here. What we're hoping is this is something will inspire other Rotary Clubs to do similar projects. And if you have members or have contacts that are interested in the project, um, I'd suggest you contact us, particularly Mark. Uh, we can certainly use help with hardware, with software. Um, if you're looking at other countries with getting material in different languages digitally that we can put on, uh, one of the things we're looking at is working with uh, what we call First Nations, our Indigenous people in Canada. And part of what we're talking about is videotaping elders in their native language, so that language would always be preserved for the students to follow. There's all kinds of innovations that we can do with this, and we're really hoping that, that others will, will join with us and, and make this really something that can change the world. Uh, John, that sounds amazing. Um, with the best contact information for anybody who's interested in supporting the ARIES project, be the ARIES website that you guys have, um, or would it be through um, uh, you guys each uh, through the Bellingham Rotary Club or the North Delta Rotary Club? Mark, do you the want above. contact or you want me to? Or... You're muted, Mark. Oh, sorry. This is John Emails to John, Bonnie, and myself are fine. I'm going to miss you that way. Perfect. If it's okay with you guys, I will place that link at the Tatiana, bottom. Of the Tatiana, there's something very important I think we forgot to emphasize, and that is the ARI system um, can be added to. People can add in, the, in their own countries, they can add local content. Mm -hmm. The teachers can add local content, and that is. That's why we can add um, the uh, indigenous peoples um, make, making um, videos in their own language and add that too. So it's a very flexible system. This is not a hard system. 
it comes in one way and there's no way to adapt. That makes it very powerful. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, now that we've gone through that, our Q&A portion, and if you guys don't mind, I will close the meeting and then we will stay on afterwards to add more questions and, and talk. Uh, first, I just wanna say thank you so much to Sean, Mark, and Bonnie for joining us and presenting about this really unique, very powerful, far reaching project that you guys have. I wish you so much luck as you um, synthesize the data from this last year's work and then see where the project takes you in the future. It sounds very exciting. I will place links for your guys' websites and contact information on our program meeting. And um, I'll just finish with our sum and then uh, we'll continue on the Q&A afterwards. And I'd like to say uh, thank you so much for this, joining us on this program. We have a discuss tool at the bottom of our weekly meeting page where we can write comments and, and discuss some of the ideas that were shared on this. I will send uh, Mark, uh, Bonnie and Sean, I will send you guys links to this so that if there are any questions that our club members have, I'll forward them along to you so that you can see some of the questions when this program airs. Uh, members and Rotarian guests at the bottom of this club's meeting page, you will find an attendance section as well. Uh, it helps us to know about the reach of our efforts and also serves as a map for anyone who has missed a meeting at their local club. If you put your email in, in the field uh, for the attendance, you'll get a message to pass along to your club secretary to keep up your attendance. As always, we would like to give the final word to our speakers. Sean, I'll start with you and then go to Bonnie and then to Mark. Go ahead. Again, thank you. It's, it's uh, been a pleasure to meet with your club. And as I mentioned, uh, we're not here just to talk about it. If there's someone that feels that they are interested in it or can, uh, can help us contribute to it, we would be more than happy to continue chatting with your members. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie, would you like to have a final word? Again, like like uh, Sean, I would like to thank you for giving you the for giving me the opportunity. Um, we, I, I was a teacher myself. I can tell that other woman was as well, and uh, I've never seen anything this powerful and this flexible before. That it's um, that it's heat proof and dust proof and people proof, and such rich content and so powerful. Um, we're I get goosebumps every time and it's exciting. And the thing is, we want to share it. We, it this is not, this is ours and oh, we're going to, this is not for us to hold on to power in some way. We want to share it. We want other people to learn how to develop it and move from there. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, would you like to have a final word? Um, yeah, thanks, Dr. I appreciate you guys uh, hosting this. The only thing I guess I'd add to what's been said is the one thing that I got out of, what I've always gotten out of going to Kenya and working on this is the intense desire that the students have there to learn. I, you know, in the U.S. you have to feel like sometimes they are, the students are there and you've got to drag them in. These students have been so starved for education their entire life. They know they need it and they know they want it. And when you show up for something like this, they're just chomping at the bit to get access to it because they know not only are they curious, but they know it's in their best interest to try and improve themselves through education. So it makes a big difference that they're they're avidly and, and aggressively pulling us in to do this and the teachers. Absolutely. Thank you guys all very much. I'll just stop the recording here and we'll continue in a moment.